Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. Very biased, correct? Um, yeah, of course. Well, of course. Why, of course? Anyway, this is the last one on the millennium's problems, which I feel is kind of the most difficult one to explain. Um, it's actually called existence in math gap, but I kind of feel like that was too long as the title. So I just went with uh, math gap. And yeah, we'll see what it actually means. Essentially, it means that everything is kind of discrete. Well, not everything, whatever is whatever it is will be discrete. And it's really just zero comes after one and there is what nothing like a half or something. So that's what it means. It's usually what people call quantization. So quantization is kind of an overused word. <laughs> it's completely overused. Uh, but in this context, it means kind of that everything comes in discrete packages, which is a bit surprising because there's absolutely no reason why anything should come in discrete packages in particular. Kind of classically, you never see that. Quantum, you kind of quantum mechanics, you kind of always have this. Um, yeah, for example, that the electrons kind of orbit the uh, the nucleus on certain orbits, this kind of simplified model, and not on arbitrary orbits, uh, like kind of continuous ways to, to, to go around the nucleus. There are no continuous ways to go around the nucleus. That's, that's what it should be. But they are kind of quantized ways. They only appear at certain energy levels. This is kind of the idea of quantization. And yeah, well, we're uh, looking here for the kind of a mass version of this. And I usually can never really decide with this one, because I feel like it's the most important problem on the list, or the least important problem on the list, or somewhere in between. Um, it somehow is related to a very, very, very important thing in physics, yeah? but it kind of its impact on physics is not so clear to me. It's probably not very, very great. Uh, it's more like really mathematical physics, and mathematical physics is kind of standing in between physics and mathematics, and has usually kind of impact on both sides. So in in this case of this gang mode theory, uh, I know that there's a lot of impact on the mass side, but I'm not so sure about really any impact on the physics. So for the math side, this is absolutely great. And one of the most well, important articles here on this one, where they state the problem, um, actually all, all gives the kind of long list of math type problems, of math type questions that came out uh, of this problem, but not so much about kind of the physics type approach. Anyway, let's get going. Okay, it, it really is about quantum field theory. And I never really understood what quantum field theory is supposed to be until I found this beautiful picture, uh, which kind of explains it very, very nicely. So speed is very high and size is very small. That's quantum field theory. Right? Classical mechanics, speed is very low and size is very big, whatever the motions of uh, Saturn around the sun, something like that. Uh, relativistic is usually very large things or large things, but very fast. Quantum mechanics is this idea of very small, yeah? uh, whatever the, the nucleus or something. Um, but usually not at high speed. And quantum field theory is kind of, well, those are the ones, very, very fast things at high speed. We'll see an example, like, like the, the strong forces, for example, uh, they will play a huge role in this video. And the strong forces are essentially what keeps the nucleus, the nucleus, <laughs> what keeps it together. And this young myth theory is kind of, is, is kind of a theory it was kind of came up, not kind of, that came up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the kind of the golden age of quantum field theory, where uh, they tried to kind of describe the behavior of the elementary particles. There's a quantum version, there's a non quantum version. Let's not worry about that different difference too much. But essentially, quantum field theory is the study of the, the fast and the small. So, yeah, so like combined theory of electromagnetism and the weak and strong forces, for example. Uh, electromagnetism is kind of was kind of a standard example. It's kind of what we want to uh, generalize in quantum field theory. But what I really want to sell is this picture because I like it a lot. And it kind of explained to me in one in one in one go what quantum field theory is supposed to be. And I hope it works really, really well uh, for you as well. Anyway, so what we're talking about is a certain type of theory, a certain type of model, and it's like very, very, very popular nowadays in different forms. And the name was coined by Hermann Weil, one of my heroes. It's called the gauge theory. Um, and gauge theory just means says that there's a group of symmetries involved, and the group of symmetries is usually some Lie group. Right. Fine. Here are some examples 
so usually you think about something like S23, S3, something like that. So it's not a matrix type. Groups. And yeah, well, that's why it is a gauge theory. Essentially, there's a gauge group involved, which is usually a Lie group of symmetries of a certain system. Uh, here are some examples. And usually it turns out in, in the story of, of gauge groups, if, if the gauge group is abelian, like in ordinary magnetism, what we want to generalize, like the Maxwell type approach electromagnetism, um, the gauge group is abelian, and that's usually easy. Right? Abelian is really easy in this context. Uh, but what you really want for something uh, well, of importance nowadays, I guess electromagnetism is still important, but anyway, of importance in the sense that we don't understand it very well, is something like the standard model. So for the standard model of quantum physics, um, you need you usually need some non-abelian theory, and there's a huge gap between the understanding between the abelian theory and the non-abelian theory. Essentially, you can think of as soon as it's non-abelian, we have no clue. At all. That's that's a bit over the top, but you know, uh, you get the point. Well, well, whatever. Whether that's over the top or not. <laughs> anyway, the point is um, so there's my, my favorite cards here. So if you're not into Magic the Gathering, I'm also not into Magic the Gathering. But this card is really cool. I sold the picture link in the description, um, which explains the Young Mills mass gap in one spell, because uh, or whatever, one enchantment, I guess, because each spell that would cost less than one mana cast to cast costs one mana to cast. So it's really just saying that there is nothing between zero and one, right? Every spell that would co cost whatever kind of mana to cast. 0 0.3 or something. This is probably not 0 0.3. But anyway, will automatically, it doesn't exist, will automatically upgrade it to at least uh, one mana. And having a precise formulation of this is kind of key. So the mass gap is essentially saying that particles have positive mass. Right? So there is nothing between zero and well, there is some gap. And then you start somewhere. You can normalize that to one, whatever. And that's usually a quantum phenomenon. Okay. So the stuff is what you can think of, of is like strong force is very strong, but also short range, which doesn't really make any sense if you think about it as an electromagnetic wave. Um, but if you think about this, that that's actually given by particles, and the particles have some mass, then it kind of makes some sense. And essentially, that's what it's supposed to be. And then this young myth theory is a model trying to describe the world, and it's actually pretty good. So people really don't want to throw it away. So most, most things are experimentally verified, um, whatever that means. It could be a real-world verification or computer verification, some model, some simplified model, something like that. Uh, but the, the mass gap is something that has been experimentally verified in this golden age of quantum field theory in the 60s, 70s. Um, but it's not really part of the classical young Mill theory. So somewhat our understanding here is, is lacking. We have a theory which we don't want to throw away because it kind of is a model, right? It's a kind of really good. But then there is something that is kind of given by experiment, but you kind of can't really um, justify it mathematically. And this is what this math gap problem is all about. Essentially finding a mathematical justification and an axiom system uh, to explain this middle mass of a particle type of a phenomena, right? Each spell that would cost yeah, if you're here again, it would cost less than one mana to cast, costs one mana to cast. Um, and that's essentially what it is all about. And the rest is just uh, difficult axiomatic systems, but uh, but they're really difficult in the sense that we don't know them. I'll go back that, to that in a second. And it's a quantum phenomena. So you want a quantum and it's kind of uh, time space. So you want some 4D system. So the Millennium Surprise problem is then. Um, the existence, which really just means writing down an axiom system of such a quantum gang, uh, quantum gang Mills theory, which has this mass gap property. And let me just give you an example instead of writing down uh, the axioms, which nobody can, <laughs> and it gets too confusing anyway. So there is a certain type, which is essentially again the strong force, the quantum uh, chronodynamics, the uh, QCD for short, and this is a young Mills theory kind of describing the, the quantum theory of gluons and quarks, so it's essentially the strong force, with the gauge group being SU3, okay, not a beer, yeah? And um, an experiment or a computer verification, uh, you can actually see uh, that quantum field theory, and in particular, this QCD as well, 
as a mask gap, let's say at normal temperatures, there's some strange thing going on at high temperatures. Let's ignore that. Uh, let's, let's say there's a mass gap. So somewhat, whatever kind of particles are involved, they should have some positive mass. And this is the mass gap problem, kind of demonstrate theoretically the existence of a mass gap for the QCD coming from uh, the quantum gang milk theory, or for SU3 or for some more general uh, gauge group. That's essentially the problem. The mass gap problem mathematically um, is really just, just if write down an axiom system, which nicely models what you want to be modeled, and then verify mathematically that this one has a mass gap. And mass gap, by the way, mathematically really just means that a certain operator has a spectrum which is bounded away from zero. That's, that's it. So there's some number usually people call delta, and the delta is bigger than zero, and the spectrum is beyond delta. Okay. And yeah, so classically, this is really kind of well understood. And quantum, this is not understood at all. And in, in the sense that nobody even can write down axioms for this left to side, justifying anything like a mass gap. So the state of the art here is, I think, pretty, uh, let me just, should I say pathetic? I will say pathetic. So it's it's not, it's not probably not the problem on the list of Millennium platforms that will be solved next. It, it looks to me like it hasn't moved much in the past 25 years or so, which is a bit of a problem. But anyway. I hope this kind of is kind of clear. Um, we have a good understanding of classical young milk theory, but classical can't have a, a mass gap that's a quantum phenomenon. So you want to write down a quantum young milk theory, but nobody really knows how to do that. Left the side showing, because nobody knows how to do, or write it down, how can you even show that, they, that such a thing has a mass gap? So the problem itself is then writing down an exit system, which kind of mimics what you want from experiments, and show that it has uh, one of those mass gap problems. For example, in this thing of this kind of in the setting of trying to write down an axiom system for the strong force. I hope that makes some sense. Well, so essentially there is some form of the standard model. Um, and yeah, so that's an idea of difficulty of renormalization, which I'm not going to explain too much, but essentially that is the problem which makes this so hard to define uh, because you kind of want to take a limit of something that goes to infinity, but then you have a problem with renormalizing it. Anyway, so essentially we are up for a quantum version of, of the standard model, a mass version of that. And sadly, at this stage, as far as I'm aware, there's no satisfying mathematical definition of what it even should be. So we are really kind of really far away from saying anything here. Um, well, Experiment works out pretty well. Experiment could mean simplified models. Experiment could mean real world. Experiment could mean computer. So experimentally, this is very highly verified, but there is no satisfying model right now that you can write down. Establishing those axioms, and that specific list of axioms you want, that's the existence part. And showing this additional property is then the mass gap problem. And essentially, the importance comes from, well, you want to find a foundation for the standard model in its various incarnations, and also some cool math things actually come out um, of the standard model, uh, of this approach, like the Jones polynomial comes out, if you like, uh, not in variance, for example. But essentially, that's it. So the idea is that we have a theory which works classically really well, and uh, we understand it very well, the young milk theory, and we really need this quantum version because it's kind of uh, well, forced upon us by real world experiments, but nobody really knows how to do that. And the problem, the millennium surprise problem is to write it down, or kind of write down an axiom system that is satisfactory and establish that it has this uh, experimentally verified property of a minimal mass of a particle. That's the problem. Um, and it's important stems from, well, it's a standard model, and kind of the, the, the kind of the cool interplay between mass and physics. So kind of physics determinates some interesting mass, and some a lot of interesting mass already came out of this problem without us making really any further progress. Uh, as far as I'm aware, progress here is very, very, very slow, but still outcome on the mathematics side is really, really great, which is kind of really nice. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.